So thank you all for coming today. Uh, okay, so our focus today is to first of all, take you all through the environment and give you some first-hand experience. If you have your, um, your PC set up, you can, you can follow along as we, we teach. That's it. Um, last week, we talked briefly about the tools that we can use to practice assembly language. And uh, I have already mentioned that there are a couple of them, about four. You can have the netwide assembler, which is the one we're going to use today. So in short, is NASM. Okay. So Microsoft has also got an environment for that and so on and so forth. But we are interested to use um, NASM just to practice um, some examples as far as assembly language programming is concerned. I hope this will not end here. Um, I want to rip your interest into launching into other embedded software development projects. Okay. Yeah, so first, what you need to set up or start practicing is you need to set a virtual uh, virtualization tool. Um, that's if you don't want to do dual, dual operating system, right? So you could, you could as well install Ubuntu as a second OS, or it's not necessary. So if you have um, Windows, you can just install something like uh, VMware Workstation or VirtualBox. And once you install that, you will be able to create instances of virtual machines. Okay, so if you would look at my system here, I have VMware Workstation. And on the VMware Workstation, I have a couple of instances. I have Kali set up here. I can always power this virtual machine on. You see these blue buttons here. It's pretty easy to do so. I just uh, click on power on this virtual machine and then it gets on and I can log in um, my credentials, okay. All right, so, so this is it for Kali. Um, last week, I also mentioned that if you are interested in cybersecurity, you could look at other things like this. Metasploitable, okay? Metasploitable is one of the instances that we use to practice um, in cybersecurity as far as um, testing the vulnerability of systems and networks and so on, and web systems are concerned, okay? So you can equally do the same thing, like you power it on and then you can use it. All right. So. In this class, I, I am actually going to use, um, I'm not going to use Kali, I'm going to use Ubuntu um, because I feel like um, it's better for this NASM, but you could use Kali as well, no restrictions. And you can use um, the Microsoft Assembler also, that's also fine. Right, let's move on. The next thing is, once you uh, get in there, Okay, so once you get in here in the environment, you pretty much have access to a lot of things. Um, I'm not going to be teaching you Ubuntu because that's not the course. I am sure you've done this maybe in your first semester or something. Yes or no? Okay, so I need to use a terminal to teach you this um course this nasm thing all right so i'll give you a couple of shortcuts that you can use i don't know whether you met them during your other classes but once i give you if, if you find it relevant you can write it down um it will make working around your linux uh, os is fantastic so if you want to pop up the terminal pretty quick you use the control plus alt plus t and that uh, pushes up the terminal for you. The other way is for you to go and then search it. Okay. Just like come in here and then type in terminal. Pretty slow sometimes anyway, but you would get it anyhow. All right. 
Okay, if you do not want to use this approach, you can just follow the shortcut I mentioned, control alt T, that also launches the terminal for you. Okay, that's fine. Now, the second thing I'm going to tell you, once you have your, your, um, um, your terminal up, you want to install the NetWide assembler. And to install it, you can use the simple Linux command for installation, okay? Which is sudo apt, you can do apt dash get install, then you tell the software name you want to install. Or you can simply go sudo apt install, then NASA. Okay, it's going to ask you because this time it's going to act as a root, what we often call like, like an administrator. So it's going to ask you for a password. Please take it easy, gentlemen. Okay, it's going to ask you for a password. Then you should put the password for your OS, your Linux OS in there. Now, I appreciate that some of you may know this, but to be very honest, others may not know it at all. So it's important we go through all the steps so that we are all on the same page. Is that okay? Is that okay, guys? Right. So anytime you go to the video, you have all the steps there and it's easy for you to get back up again. So this is done. Um, now, once I get my NASM installed, there are other dependencies I need to get. The binary utilities library, I need to get that one. Okay, so I'll go sudo apt again, install, then it's called bind utils. Okay. And then there you go. So once that is installed, then we are pretty much set to start practicing um, our assembly language codes. However, you may need what we call a text editor, okay? So Linus has already got Nano, but there are other text editors. If you need them like EFAD and so on, you can equally do the same thing, sudo up get installed, EFAD, and then you get it EFAD installed, and then you can launch it and use it. But in this class, we are going to use Nano for the, as a text editor for our um, assembly practice. So I will launch Nano, but to do that, you would have to type Nano and then you give the file name. Okay, so as we always do in every class of programming, we often want to test the Hello World code. And with the Hello World code, you get pretty much exposed to what is the structure, for example, of uh, building a simple assembly language program. And then you get to understand the commands and the rules around the, the, um, the, program, the programming language. So just a few things to tell. Um, often we'd say that assembly language seems to be like one of the unstructured low level languages. You can pretty much um, play around with the organization. There are three sections, as I mentioned the other time, section.text, section.data, and section.bss, okay. Um, you could put any of them anywhere at the beginning of your lines, okay. So in some programs, you would see that section.data is at the start or at the beginning of the lines. Others, you would find that it's even at the last part of the program, okay? So it doesn't matter. I mean, assembly is pretty fine with that. You can move it all around. Now to comment, you need a, a semicolon. So let me just show that here. We are going to do nano. I've pretty much got a few hello codes on there, but I'm, I'm going to call it hello. Um, then you add the extension, ASM. So then you press on enter and you have the nano open for you with the file. Hello.asm. All right. So now we're going to start to write our lines. Now, let me mention that if you want to comment, you use a semicolon, then you can say, this is my first 
assembly program. Okay. Now, we will begin, sorry, we'll begin with the codes. I will briefly explain what each line means, but that may not be very helpful to some of you if you do not know this environment at all. Okay, so in order to help after this, I will give further explanation. Now you should understand that the fundamentals is at this point. Okay, so everything you're going to learn at this point of the hello world is virtually applicable when you're doing all of the big, big programs. Okay, so you want to get the fundamentals pretty much right. Okay, so we're going to start. And to start with, you just go global and then you give a tab. Okay, take note of that. And then we want to give it a label. The label is start. Okay, so global underscore start. Now, this is going to be our label we're going to use in the section dot text. Okay, so that's it. So we press enter and then we use the same label. So this same idea applies when you are programming with macros. Okay, you give a macro label and then you call the label and then you put the main codes for the label there. Okay. So start, and then you don't put a label without a full column. You must always end it with a full column, okay? Right, and then, but sorry, before that, we need to do our section dot text that will allow us to write the main code. The section dot text is where you put the actual code, if you would say. Okay, so we do a tab and then we do section, now, before we type the dot text, we need to give one space, dot txt, okay. Then we come enter, and then we do underscore start. Your label name, you should, you should know, okay? You should know the label name. However, it's important to mention that assembly language is not case sensitive. Do you guys follow? Okay. Right, so that's it. So then I start with move. Now this MOB, as I mentioned previously, is a mnemonic that represents or means to move. Okay, so we're going to do this program in the 64 bits. Okay, uh, I've told you we have 32, we have 16, we have eight. But we're going to do this hello all thing in 64 bit. I'll also show you um, how to do this again in 32 bit. And then we'll try to compare and see the differences and similarities. Okay. Right. So we are going to do a tab and a single space. And then we say RAX, comma, one. Okay, don't worry if you don't understand this, but RAX is the first argument. Okay, when, when I say argument about the section dot text and you do not understand it that much, when we get deeper, I will explain further. But let me just say that the RAX is the first argument if you want to write a sys call for printing or sys call for writing, if you call it, okay. So you remember that when we showed you the layers, you, you can see that assembly language calls functions from the operating system, okay? So this syswrite is also one of the OS calls or sys, uh, operating system calls just to leverage the function in the operating system to write out or to print some kind of statement. Okay. So this is not the only syscall we have in assembly language. In fact, there are just so many. If you want to do input and output, you need to use a sysread. Okay, sysread also has got its arguments. All right, so you guys should follow very well. If you want to exit, you use sys exit. And it also has got its own arguments. 
So when we get there, I'll show you the multiple arguments we have and the multiple syscalls that are available that you can use. Okay, so that's it. And then I will go enter, or if you like, you can leave a comment. If you, if you want to leave a comment, you just say, um, this is for OS call, something like that. Okay, all right. So you tab again and you do move. We are going to tab one space. Now we are going to call um, another register, RDI one. Again, this is also the second argument, okay, for syswrite. That's the second argument. So you should take note of that. You pretty much need four arguments for syswrite. In other words, if you want to print a statement in assembly, you need four arguments. So the first, in the 64 bit, I must say. So the first one is the RAX, and then the second one is the RDI, and then you go with RSI and you go with RDX. Okay, but you can put this in, in any, pretty much of any order if you want. Okay, so RDI is an argument for uh, a file descriptor, or if you like, whether it should be a, a standard output or not. Okay, so the values are either one or zero, but usually if you want to write out, you use one. Okay, so that's why you see move RDI one. Okay, good. Now the next one. So we go move. We do a tab, a single space if we want. And we're going to call the next argument, which is RSI. So pretty much it, I, I can equally quote this register using capital R, R capital R S I. It's okay. Assembly also knows that you're talking about the RSI register. So it's, it's not case, case sensitive. Okay. Now, RSI is the third argument. And in this argument, it is asking you for where can I find the string you want to print? Okay. So that's the, the function of the RSI register. So you would have to put the address to the string at this point okay so we have not yet done section dot data where we can actually define the string to be passed to this particular syscall we haven't gotten there but we know that we want to use uh some variable to represent this so let's say our variable is message okay so RSI message. Now you go to the next step and you call the fourth argument, MOV. Let's do a tab, a single space. We just want it to be nicely arranged, sort of. Okay, so the fourth argument you're going to use is RDX, comma. Now RDX is asking you for the length of the message or whatever string you want to print out okay so this is also very important so so you realize that these four basic um lines will be necessary if you think you are doing any huge program it's it's relevant so you must know that this four makes up the sys right and always the values that we move is one for rx one for rdi and then the variable for the string we want to declare into RSI register and the, the length of the particular string we want to output. Okay. So here 13 with the hello world, including the space and all that. Okay. Right. So it is better that the length you declare not, is not lesser than the particular bytes you define, okay? So if you're saying 13 bytes, and then the definition for your byte in the section.data is overlay, then you have an error, 
You guys follow? Okay, right. So this is also applicable in any of the programming. If you're doing a, if you're doing high level programming as well, okay. You don't declare over what you have already assigned, the memory you have already assigned, okay. Right, so then for our OS to know that we are actually calling a function, we use the last line syscall, okay. So this will invoke the operating system functions. Now in 32 bits, you wouldn't use this. I think you use int zero x, blah, blah, blah. So that's also its way of invoking. Okay, so now we are good. We have the print statement here. Now we need to exit. So to exit, we call the syscall for exit. Okay, which is also just two, needs two arguments. The syscall for exit needs two arguments. And that is pretty simple. It's, um, let's do a tab, it's MOV. Um, you need to use REX as the first argument, okay. And then REX will take, sorry about this, let's do a tab, single space, REX. REX will take the value of 60. Okay, so that means that here, unlike REX taking value as one in the syscall for right, REX takes the value of 60 in the syscall for exit. Do you notice the difference? Okay, and, and these, are, these are values that you should always keep in your mind actually, because it's, it doesn't change if you want to exit in 64 bits. Okay. Right. And then the next thing we do is to call the second argument, which is an XOR, XOR of um, the RDI, the RDI register, which carries the number of bits. We just XOR. We XOR it. So who can tell me why it's necessary to XOR RDI against RDI? Any clue? Any clue? It's it's pretty simple. Let me see those who can things out of the box. We are exiting, right? And I'm saying that there are two main arguments. You first have to use RAX argument, and the value it carries is 60. And then the second one is you XOR RDI against RDI. Any clue? If you XOR one against one, what's the answer? Is what? Is what? Okay, so if we XOR RDI against RDI, it means that the 13 byte we have, it's just like filling it with zero. Okay, so it's like when you're doing high level programming, you return zero. Are you following, guys? Okay. I put some of you here. All right, so that's it. So, and then we have to invoke. We invoke Cisco. Okay. Now we need to do our section of data where we are going to actually initialize the variable message. Okay. So we go into and then we do section of data. So tab section. And then space, single space, that's it, the data. OK. And then what is the variable we used in the syswrite? What's the variable? What is it? Message, right? So pretty simple, pretty simple. So we do message and then colon. And we go to space define byte is db. Okay, now you need this to be able to define the strings that you want to pass to the variable message. Okay, so define byte, then one space, and you go to just as you can um, initialize a string in Python. If you're initialized, you put double quotes, right? Okay, it's similar also here. So you do. You do your hello world.
So that's it. And you do your comma, you give a space. This is a value for next line. Okay. Now, you, you can count pretty much the number of characters. Okay, you know in, in programming, each character is how many bits? How many bits? Huh? <laughs> it's one byte, right? Okay, eight bits if you would say. All right. So that's it. So this is actually the end of the lines, or if you like, the instructions for printing hello world. So if you if you put it in sections, you are actually having this this part from from this part. Okay, this is invoking the print message, if you would say. And then this part, okay, from the RAX60 is exiting, and then you are actually initializing. Okay, the variable, that's it. So once you are done in nano, you can save by doing control plus O, okay. And then it's going to ask you of the file name, but we have it already, so we just um, press enter. And it tells you the number of lines that have been written. Okay. Right. Any questions till now? I think no questions. Yeah. Okay. So we are going to try to run our code and see if it works or if there are any errors, then we fight around it. <laughs> so I'll open the terminal, control T, and then to execute, or if you like to run. Your source file, who can remember? It's, I think we all know that, right? It's Nazem, what? Dash F, ELF, 64. Now I explained this the other time. I said that you are going to, your first step is you're trying to convert this into an object code, right? So to do that, you need to tell us the format of the object code you want. And because this was programmed in 64 bits, we want to make it ELF64. Okay, so NASM dash format, and then the format is defined to be 64 bits. So in other words, if you are running a 32 bit program, what does the line change to become? Yes? NASM what? Dash format ELF32 bits. Is that also? Then you give us the file name. Okay, so now CC4, and then what's the file name we used? Hello, hello right? I think. Dot ASF. All right, so once you run and you don't get any errors, it means that your code is better, is good, is clean. But if there are errors, when you run, you wouldn't get the object file created. Now, the fact that we have no errors means that the, the program is correct. Okay, right. So we can list, you just do ls to see whether the object is really there. So can you see hello.o here? You can see that, right? So it means it has, been able to, so to say, compile it into an object, okay. Then the next thing we do is that we need to link the object to a library. Do you guys remember this? In the architecture, you have your source file, take it to an object, you link it to a library, and then that gives you an executable file, and then you execute it. Okay, so you should know about the process. So in the 64 bits, it's pretty easy. You just do LD, okay? And then the file name of the object. So LD hello.o. Okay, this is not the same when you want to link in, um, in the 32 bit. 
when you are linking in the 32 bits, you need to create uh, what, what we call the, just like what you do when you don't have Android OS and all that. So you sort of have to create an architecture, okay? A 32-bit architecture in your line of code so that it compiles on that, okay? So like you want to run an Android app, but it cannot run on OS and um, Windows OS. So you install what? What are some of the apps you can install? What? Blue stacks, right? Okay. So that you can be able to run those apps. Kind of the same. Okay. Right. So let's move on. So this is successful as well, and it has created a file for us that is an executable file. But in the 64-bit, it always leaves it in a particular file name called a.out. Okay, so when we do the list same, we will see that. So anytime we get an object, linked to a library, it goes back to save in the a.out. Now to run it simply in the um, Linus, just the simple Linus code if you want to execute a file. So a.out, all right? And then you, you can get your, you can get your hello world printed. So this is very simple thing. Any questions till now? Okay, I think we are all fine. Now, let us look at a 32-bit Hello World code, okay? So I have it already on my PC, so we don't go through all these steps again. So I'm just going to open it from now. So I'll do nano, nano opens. If I want to open a file in nano, I just use the shortcut Control R, and it will ask me for the file name. So I'll just put the file name there. Um, I named it Hello32. Dot ASF. So it opens the code for me here. So you can see here that these are the registers that you use in 32 bits. Okay. Now, what are the interesting things you find here? ECX, EBX, EX, and then you realize that invoking the OS is pretty different, right? Okay. So Whilst invoking the OS in the 64 bits is just doing syscall, here you have to do int what? 0x18. Right. And then you, you could see also here the variable is what? MSG. And then we have defined the byte as hello world with an exclamation point here. And then this is the next line string here. Pretty interesting. Okay, so but in 64, we just do 10. But you see another thing that EQU, the equal mnemonic here, this mnemonic is, is to help you sort of define a constant, um, constant variable, if you would say, to just say that this particular variable is supposed to be constant. Okay, right. So you have len EQU, and then dollar sign dash MSG. All right. So I think you, you can see this is pretty also simple. You have registers, you are using the first argument in 60, I'm sorry, in 32 bits. The first argument is with your EDX. And of course you can rearrange any time, but with your EDX, you put in the length of the variable you're about to print out. And then ECX takes the variable and then um, EBX is the standard output, okay? Uh, whether one or zero, if you remember. And then you, you should get what brings out the, um, the syscall, for example, in this case, syswrite. Now, if we're using 64 bit will rather say move rex4 and uh, sorry move rex1 okay so it's different move rex1 is what we'll call the syswrite in operating system for us 
but in 32 bits, move EX4. Okay, so that means that that's the value that must be passed to that argument that calls the printing out, okay, or the system. So you understand them. And they, I mean, once you know them, that's all. If you are doing 32 bit, this is how to write, that's all. Okay. So in the exams, if eventually you are asked to write any program and you think you cannot write anything, just write this, it's okay. Just do a sys write, it's okay, you can just, and you log get zero, I think. <laughs> yeah, because it will, it will always be the same. Yeah. It's forehead and then see whether it's okay. All right, good. So thank you guys. Now we'll go back to the terminal and then run it. Just to also show you how to run this in 32 bit. Okay, so quite important. So yeah. Nazem. Format ELF 32. Okay, and then we go, we call the file name is hello 32.asm. Yeah, again, we have a successful code compiled, and then we want to see where the object is. You can see hello 32.o here, but linking. The linker for the 32 bit is pretty different because you need to create some kind of processor architecture to run this, okay? So what we're going to use is the I386 architecture. Okay. So we will do LD and then we say we want to switch mode Okay, to ELF underscore I386. So we are switching mode to a particular architecture. Okay, which by default we don't have in our um, OS, if you would say. And so we switch the mode and then we say dash S to a particular object we want to call. And that object is hello32. And then, sorry, it should give us an output, okay, an executable file output with the name hello32, okay? And then what should actually be converted into that hello32 executable file is the object, is the object hello32.o. Okay, so once we get it like this, then we run. Now we have, we have the executable file and the name for the executable file will be hello32 because that's how we said it should call it. So you can list and see, look for hello32 is here already. So we just execute it just like we do in any, uh, And we look at the available syscalls, we look at the available arguments, and that should also help us to do further programming, if you would say. So for example, I can give you an assignment. For example, you should write this, you should extend this program to take an input of a user and print it out, okay? So it means that you need to add on some sys read to do this. Okay, so you need to understand the arguments for each of the sys calls, then you'll be able to do this. Okay. As a matter of fact, write it down is an assignment.
Okay. So we are L3 today. Okay. I will take this assignment um, next week. Just, it's, it's pretty simple. Extend this basic hello world code to rather take an input string from a user and print it, that's all. So you change a few things and add another syscall, that's all. But by the end of the class today, you know which syscall you should add. In fact, there are other assignments today, added to this one, this is um, the first. Don't worry, I mean, doing assignments should be part of you as a student, you know. When you're a student, it should be that you are very busy with assignments, you know, so that you don't get time to play around, I think. Yeah. But at the end of the day, it's not compulsory, okay? No assignment of mine is compulsory. Yeah. So so please understand that. It's, even my mid-term is not compulsory, exams are not compulsory. They are all not compulsory. You only lose some marks. That's all. Yeah. So if you don't do your quizzes, it's fine. You lose some, you know, five or it's okay. Maybe you lose some marks. It's fine. Like you miss assignments, you lose some five or ten marks. It's okay. Yeah. But don't ever think it's compulsory. Don't push yourself if you can. Just relax. I mean, life is life is easy. <laughs> <laughs> or you don't like this government policy. You don't like it. Yeah. You should do it. It will help you. The more you practice, the better you become. I think. Right. So as you've seen already, there are three important sections. The data, the BSS, the text. Now, because of these three sections, we are able to land on what we call memory segments in assembly. Okay. So we have the first one is data segment. Okay. So the data segment is represented by the dot data and the dot BSS. So the dot BSS and the dot data form what we call the data segment of the memory. Okay, so you guys should know this. And it's having this basic understanding will help you to write even high level, um, if you like, difficult programs in assembly, I think. Yeah, so you should know that dot BSS and dot um, data has got to do with data, the segment of data in the memory. So when you are dealing with any type of data, you know in which section you should actually put this code. Okay, all right. So this section cannot be expanded after the data elements are declared. In other words, for example, when we, that in the same way I explained, just like you cannot declare over the length. Okay, so that's another way to say this. So when, once you say, hey, my my print statement is going to take 13 bytes, and then you define the bytes to be in the region of 13. You cannot let it exceed the run out of the program. Okay. All right. So the dot BSS section, think of it more like a buffer. Okay. So it holds some data temporarily during the process or during the execution process. Okay, so that's what the, the main function 
of the dot BSS, more or less like to reserve bytes. Okay. And then we have the code segment of the memory, which is represented by the dot txt, the dot text. Okay. Now let's move on. So this is this is where in the dot text, this is where you're going to do all the massive coding. Like you can do procedures there, you can do um, conditional statements there, you can do all of that stuff right there. So you don't go do um, conditional statements and other stuff in the dot data or the dot VSS. No, the dot data and the dot VSS only has got to do with data. Dot VSS is a buffer to reserve, and then dot data will contain the data that will be used in your execution. So you should know the differences. Okay. And as you are writing your assembly codes, you are dealing with assembly registers. So I mentioned briefly some registers that are necessary for syswrite. So who can tell me just one register relevant for this right one just one register yes anybody for two points yes rx right good okay you send me your index number privately okay yeah yes i'm over rsi yes okay any lady is only two boys now any lady or oh, the ladies club is there Yes, I'm there. R A R D was R D I. Beautiful, thank you. Okay. So, so yeah, these are just four registers you know now, but there are just many. So I'm going to show you. I'll give you in the slide. I think if you read before coming to class, you have seen that there is a, a cheat sheet of registers. Okay, and you should know you should know what register to use at the time. Okay, some registers are for pointers, others are for data. Okay, so we'll get to know all of that. So we have um, data registers and pointer register. So let's go on to talk about that one. So to speed up the processor operation, the processor includes some internal memory storage locations, which is called the registers. Okay. You know how the, the fetch and execution cycle is. I've explained this in the other class. You have your CPU, the RAM, or what you call the memory, is closer to the CPU. It fetches the instructions from the run and then executes it, so on and so forth. And I've been extended into explaining what you should look for as specifications when buying pieces and all that. Okay, so you have cache in between there, which is helping to, I mean, make it very easier for the processor to execute instructions, okay? Now, again, the processor thinks that it's too much longer process to always be coming to the, the run. okay? So it also, has got uh, internal memory for the registers. Okay, so it can also fetch instruction from the registers. Okay, which is closer and quite faster. Okay, but they all work hand in hand. If you say. So the registers store data elements for processing without having access to, uh, without having to access the memory. Okay. So a limited number of registers are built into the process action, okay. We don't want it to overwhelm the processor's uh, ability. So we just, um, we just build uh, some chips with just a limited number of registers, okay. So let's look at uh, what each processor can take per its architecture. So if you look at um, a 32-bit processor, the instruction architecture, of course, will be of the 32 architecture, and it can hold 32 bits. 
This means that each register can hold these values. The unsigned values is from zero to this, and then the sign from that to that. So you could see the, the range that a 32 bit architecture can contain. In a 64 bit case, you have the registers holding only 64 bits. Okay. So you see the the limitation of each register in the, with respect to the kind of processor we have. Okay, right. So that means that it cannot be device first. Now. You cannot have 32 bits processor having registers that holds like 64 bits of, of data. No, it's not possible. Okay. So at any time in the 64 bit processor, its register can contain this amount of signed and unsigned values. So let's look at the groupings for registers, like whether it's 32 or 64 bits. They are grouped into three categories. We have the general register, and we have the control registers, and the segment registers. So they are three. Now, these three have also got subcategories. The general registers comprise the data registers, pointer registers, and index registers. Okay, right. And that brings us to look at how the register table looks like. So, this is the, the kind of a cheat sheet I was talking about. So, if you look at a 64 bit register, Obviously, it's in what kind of processor? Yes, anybody? This is what base register is in what kind of processor? It's for me. It's a very simple question. It's not, it's not anything tough. But look at this side. You can identify REX, right? You can identify RBI, RSI. There. Okay. But it, once we come down, you see, for example, we have EX, REX. AX, AL. AX is coming from more or less like a part of the system orbit, right? It's like a division, if you would say. And then EX carrying a different um, starting character. Okay, but it's also from the AX um, pattern, right? But once it gets to the 8 bit, it changes its nomenclature. Okay. So, Later, as we move on, you, you get to understand, oh, which one is the data register? Oh, that one, that one, and that one. You can make the difference, okay? So you'll be looking for this, these things like, what is, it, what is the data register among the set of uh, registers we have? So that when you are dealing with data in your program, you know the correct register to call. You understand? So you don't just call the registers, each of them are what they are. And some are pointers and some are indexes. So sometimes a little trick is like you have the pointers ending with a P. Okay. But if that is not a standard approach to determine. Okay. Yeah. So it's like you have REX divided into two and then you have EX and then like that. Just, just go on like that. Okay. So let's look at more examples of. Data registers. So in 32 bits, the data registers are EX, EDX, ECX, and EDX. Okay. So what will be the corresponding 64 bit registers? What? Just append it with R. That's all. Replace the E with R. So RX, RDX. RCX. Okay. So lower house of the 32 bit registers can be used as four system based data registers. In other words, if you would just look at the picture I showed you, it's like when you divide 32, you have 16, right? So you have, you, you'll be able to create like four of the 16 bit data registers from the 32 bit data registers. Okay. In other words, 
the data registers in a system bit CV, if there is anything like that that exists, is AX, DX, CH, and DX. So it goes on and to the level of the um, the eight bits is AH, AL, and so on. So this is just a diagram to explain what the divisions means, actually. Now, now we know that data registers has got to do with data, but even with that, there are some that are accumulators, some that are base, and so on and so forth. So you you would need to be able to differentiate between that. Now I'll tell you, okay. Now, some of these data registers have specific usage in arithmetic operations. Okay, so for example, the AX family, okay, used to store, they are registers used to store data and also for arithmetic operations. The AX family, okay, EX, uh, RX, and so on. Okay, so we call that a primary accumulator. So for example, if you are doing multiplication in assembly, one operand should be stored in EX, okay? Why? Because we know EX is a data register and it's also an accumulator, all right? So we can store one of the operands in our multiplication in EX, or we can store it in AX or AL, okay? Or if in 64, we can store it in what? We can store it in what? RX, okay? So when you're writing a multiplication code, you can, you can do that. In the same way, like you're writing a, a code to do addition, and you want to store one operand in a certain register, then the correct register to use would be the, the AX family. Okay. Right, now BX, the BX family is known as the base register, and it could be used in index addresses. Okay. And then now you come to the CX, that one is for counting, okay? That is counting. So it's known as the count register and it's got its uh, family members like ECX and, and so on. <laughs> All right. So you can also use CX along with AX even in multiplication and division operations. Okay, yeah. So, if you look at the Hello World code, okay, this is this is the same thing, no difference. Then that the label is now main. Is that also? Can you guys see that? Okay, the label is main, and then the reason why we do the global thing is for us to tell the linker where to start the program from. Okay, so that's quite relevant. Now you have the session of text carrying the main codes, and you starting from MOBDX to MOBEX. These are the four arguments for the sys write in a 32 bit. Okay, and then the int 0, x 0, a 0 would invoke the OS to run that. So we've already explained what these things mean as well. Okay. This is 32 and this is 64. Okay. So if you compare, what's the difference? This is a very simple question. Very simple. Any difference? Yes, someone. A very simple question. Yes. Yes, brother. Is there what? Aha. Uh -huh. Like reorganization, right? Okay. Yeah. Which I think is cool with it. I mean, assembly doesn't matter where you put these stuff, right? But you definitely have to tell the linker where your code is beginning. That one, you don't mess with it, right? You can play around every other thing, but you don't. Any other difference? Yes. The name of the register, right? So we are using two different registers, right? One is what? 3, 2, and the other is 64, right? Pretty simple. Pretty simple. Yeah. And then, which ones are the data registers and which ones are the counter and which ones are the, you, you guys can follow that, right? So do you see a counter register here? Which one is that? 
ECX. You see that one? Okay. And and then what else do you see? EAX is storing some, it's been assigned to some uh, value, okay? Maybe just at this stage, you may not really appreciate it. But when we have a lot of uh, lines written, you can appreciate what each of them um, is used for, okay? So you, you should check this. When we say, for example, CX is a counter, when you go back to the cheat sheet, you, you look at the corresponding 32, corresponding 64, and then you know, okay, in 64, this is the counter. You guys get that? Okay. You said, what is the meaning of the, the zero time gone? Yeah, it's the next line. Right. Just like if we do the 10 in the 64. Okay. Okay, any question? Okay, cool. Let's move on. So I've explained all of this. I wouldn't repeat. This um, subsequent slide sort of breaks down the codes for you with explanations, okay? Which I've already done that. So now let's um, try to go on to understand what the labels, what labels actually mean and what the syscalls mean and other kinds of syscalls that will be relevant as we move on in the course, okay? So all 86 or um, 64 assembly files have three sections. We've talked about this already. And then they are all declared before whatever elements that needs to come in, come on. But then we have labels. Uh, we use labels that is part of the code, and I have already explained that whenever you state a label, you need to call it at the start of um, your code, okay? So, for example, like we know um, global underscore start or global underscore main, or when you're doing macros, you can also use labels. Just name it any way you want, it's fine, okay? That's up to you. So anytime the name of the label is used afterwards, that name is replaced by the location in memory, okay? By the memory. right. So for example, the start label is essential for all programs or if you like the main label, it is just when your program is compiled and later executed, it starts from the location start. Okay. Is a linker kind of find that um, start label, which your global start or whatever, global main or whatever, if the linker cannot find this, it will throw it away like an error, right? Okay. So you use the global term when you want the linker to address some particular link. Okay. All right, DB is for defined bytes. Right, now let's look at system calls, okay. So you have seen some couple of them. There's the two of them, says exit and says write. But every syscall is necessary to run AS, ASM programs, okay. If you look at the layers, you realize that ASM programs can only run successfully with the help of operating systems, okay. So it's quite important to know your syscall. Now, every syscall have an ID associated with them. The ID actually is a number. And they also take arguments, okay? Arguments meaning a list of tuples. Syscalls have been explained. Now, let's look at the argument IDs and how they move along with the registers. Now, you can also equally think of these registers in terms of 32 bits, okay? Yeah. So we can always list all of them, like the same thing in 16 bits and 8 and all that. So you should think of that. So like, when you have syscall with RAS, usually the argument ID goes with the ID, 
Okay, now if you confuse that this step back, when I go forward, you get it. Okay, it goes with the ID for that particular syscall. So if you remember before this slide, I said every syscall has got an ID associated with it. You remember that, right? So the RAX register goes with the ID of that syscall. And then after that, you have argument one, two, three, and so on. So argument one goes with RDI, argument two goes with RSI, and so on and so forth. So look at the system calls and then their IDs, you see? So that is why you saw in the Hello World code, when we're doing the syswrite, RAX had a value of what? One, is that not so? It's because the syswrite ID is one, okay? So the syswrite ID is one, therefore RAX can only take the ID number what? One. Therefore, if you look at the EX taking Four, it tells you that in 32 bits, the syscall ID for syswrite is four. Are you guys following? Uh -huh. So that, that makes the difference. So, so to say the syscall ID in 32 bits is not the same in 64 bits. Okay. 64 bits syswrite, the ID is one. 32 bits, Says right, the ID is four. You see, so you should know this. You can get cheat sheets online. Okay, about this. Good. So if you want to do sys read, sys read goes with what? Zero. Is that not so? So it means that in sys read, what should be your first line? Move RX. Move RX what? Also a bit. Now you're good, I think you are fine. So, so it's easy, once you, know, once you know these things, then it's easy to write your codes very well, okay? Now, argument one to whatever length of argument, one, two, three, four, five, six. Now, argument one goes with the file descriptor. I've already showed you what file descriptor is when we're doing your codes, right? Now, who can remember what was the mm, mm, register assigned to argument one? What was the register assigned to argument one in, in, in 64? Yes. R what? RDI. Let's see if it's correct. It's correct. Yeah, it's a sharp way. <laughs> yeah. Okay, good. I love that. It looks like all of you are following it. That's nice. Okay. Good. Or oh, some people are. <laughs> Who is confused? Raise your hand and let me see. Oh, just a small portion of the class. <laughs> I think that's that's good for me, I think, because my objective is for all of you to get it. So if you are here, you have five people who don't understand, that's fine. But those who don't understand, can you tell us what is the challenge? And I'm with you, I'm not <laughs> okay, nice. So, so I think everybody should be fine in this class. Okay, yeah, we we'll take it easy. So, RDI. If I am doing sys read, I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask again. Okay, it should be fine for all of you guys. If I'm doing sys read, what will be now my second line of command? Mm -hmm. I have to go with the register what RDI. Is that also? So move RDI, what would be the value assigned to it? Okay. So because you don't know, I'll show you the answer as we move on. Okay. So you know that you need one, two, three, four. You need four registers in a sys read. You need four registers in a sys write. Do you see that, guys? Okay. And so on and so forth. So the, the first one, which is the ID, always goes with what? The AX family. Okay. So like an accumulator, you guys remember. Okay. 
So when you want to do sys open, you want to open a file. You want to open a file in assembly. Your first line should be what? Move RAX2. You get that? Okay. Uh -huh. And it goes on and on like that. So you equally can get a cheat sheet for this. There is a tall sys, uh, sys list cheat sheet. But I'm sure once, when you get it, now you'll be able to appreciate whatever is in the cheat sheet because you know what it means here. Okay. So first, uh, let me also talk about this. The second one, argument two is supposed to be a buffer. Argument three is supposed to be a counter, okay? And uh, what are the registers that acts as a buffer? Anybody with an idea? Okay, nobody. Now let's look at this. Further explanation. When we take the sys right, for instance, we have argument type, and then the description here. So the file descriptor, always we go with the standard output, okay? And that's why the value for the file descriptor is one. So I was expecting you to answer the same when I asked you with the sys read. Now that would be zero. That would be zero for sys read, okay? Because it's an input you are reading, okay? Right. Okay. Now, one, because writing is an output, okay? Right. So this, that means the second argument in a sys read will also have the value zero. Okay. Now, the buffer is that one that tells you the location of the string that you want to write. We are looking at sys write. Okay. So then the next thing. So so technically, what it means is that if you are doing like. A, sys read, you need a buffer, okay? And this buffer, think of it like a variable, okay? What you eventually declare at the dot data side, okay, in the code, okay? So you, when you write the, when you write, what will be the, what's the register for the buffer? What is the register for the buffer? Yes, anybody? RSI, so you do move RSI and then comma, then the variable name. Which is the buffer? Is that also? So now for sys read, you know what you have to write. You know the first one is R X zero, and the second one is what R R D I zero. Okay, and then the third one is what R S I what? Then the name of the buffer is that also? And then the fourth one is a counter. So that means now I'm going to tell uh, the program I am expecting this length of um, input. Is that okay? So you you have to you have to define the length you want the guy to input. Okay. Uh -huh. So that when the when the guy inputs something that is over the length, there will be an error. Okay. So this is just an idea to help you go about the homework. Okay. <laughs> you still get it, right? I won't ask you, you still don't get it. You still get it. Okay. Um Okay, nobody wants to know. Right, so let's move on. So I hope you guys are following. So that makes it very easy. Count is just the length of the string. Okay, <sighs> sorry about that. So in the case of sys right, you have RH1, and then here will be what? RDI1, and then this will take the RSI, will take the, the variable, and then this will take the length of the, the string. So what's the fourth register we're using in a sys right? Is what? RC. No, it's not RC. It's what? R what? RDS. Okay. Good. So these are like you can call them static, like you once you know them, that's all. Okay. So it's pretty simple, I think. So yeah, we've talked about this already. And yeah, pretty much the same thing here. So, so this is more or less like a further explanation to what we have said. So here, here we are basically 
showing you like in the in the code that you saw initially is it the same thing the address is ADR. this is the buffer address they are talking about and so on so if you look at the code we showed initially each of them is mapping to the syscall approach okay so it's a further explanation so rx moves to here rdr moves to there rsi just like that and so on okay good now sys exit sys exit is also a system call so it has got its own arguments so the id the id is what 60 the id for six exit is 60 you should remember this right in 64 bit i should say but who can tell me i already shown you a 32 bit code what is the id for six exit in in, in 32 is what are you sure that's what the rex takes or is what is one let's go back see it See, the EAX takes one, okay? Aha. Uh -huh. So this int 0x80 is just a command to invoke the OS, okay? But the ID for EAX, sorry, the ID for SysEx in 32 bits is one. That is why you have EAX being assigned to one, okay? But in 64 is a different case. In 64, the ID for sys exit is 60. You get that, guys? Okay, cool. Okay, so we are here. So now. RDI is the next argument, and then it's assigned as zero. What is RDI? What is RDI? RDI is like the descriptor, okay, if you accept. And when we have zero, is is to read, okay? So you technically, you are asking the, the assembler to just see that the code ends here. So read, read zero. Another way to do this is you can XOR, just like I did in my hello world code, right? So you can XOR the value here against itself. So, okay. All right. So when you when you XOR these two registers, then it's equally like saying zero. Please, when you go back home, do further reading, get the cheat sheets. I mean, last year, a couple of people right after the class, then they put in the cheat sheets in the group, you know. So you can just put in the cheat sheet for all the syscalls and the others in the group. And you can all use it for further learning and all that. So the pointer registers in text two bit is EIP, ESP, like I gave you the Q. Those ones, those registers ending with a P are the pointer registers. Okay. And the corresponding 16 bits are IP, SP, BP. What would be the corresponding 64 bits? R, 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 R. <laughs> what would be that one? So you can look at the cheat sheet, right? When you map, you see. All right. So, so the next one is an instruction pointer. So the 16 bit IP or instruction pointer register stores, it stores the offset address of the next instruction to be executed. Okay, the offset address of the next instruction. So the IP in association with the CS register, which you can call as the counter, CS is the counter for 16 bit. Okay, so the instruction pointer alongside the counter for 16 bit or even the same in 32 and upwards, it gives the complete address of the current instruction in the code segment. Okay, 
So this this is what I showed you. If you look at if you look at so I I will drop in the hello world code in a group. I will drop in the addition.asm code in a group, and then compare.asm as well. Okay. So the compare.asm I'll drop in a group is a 32 bit. So what you will do is to write the code in 64 bits. I hope you guys follow. Right, so that should be very easy for you. So now you understand everything and it should be fine. Okay, so, so that's it for today, guys.